But now let's talk with John. John, thank you for those words about the importance of having faith in difficult times. I was struck by, in recent years, how many books we've had come out promoting atheism and talking about how the church is responsible for various evils from the Crusades on down uh, and that nobody in their right mind would want to be a religious person. How do you respond to those critics? That's a good point. I think you've just made the case. And that is by identifying the message with people in the church who keep faith alive at a time when uh, so many reprehensible things are happening, often in the name of religion. I think the church, uh, the positive thing about the church is that uh, many churches, most churches, are filled with simple good people who are trying to stay alive and to deal with uh, the exigencies of their lives and who are exhibiting faith uh, in the process of doing that. And sometimes the church seems to get in the way as an institution, and I think that's what Dawkins and some of the atheists are talking about. Uh, they talk about the poisonous effects of the church through the years. And in a sense, the institution has sort of mucked things up, just as the institution of Phariseeism did in Jesus' day. But Jesus understood that, you know, that that isn't the final word. The final word is the God who has mercy and compassion on the people who need faith in order just to get by from day to day. And churches are full of these people. And being a minister is a great privilege in that sense because you're always dealing with people who are looking for the real meaning of life. John, you mentioned the power of having a good attitude and, and on your visits you always bring a positiveness with you. Can you speak a little bit more to that, how important that is, or how do we nurture that in a spiritual setting or in a faith community, I guess, so that uh -huh. that feeds us on a regular basis? Well, I think, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of it is kind of born in our personality. Sure, sure. Some people uh, have a more positive personality, some a more negative personality. Right. And I think uh, it's important in churches to kind of decide that, you know, whatever's going on, whatever fracas may be going on behind the scenes, uh, however much problem a church may be having with a staff member or something like that, it's important that for the people who come to worship and the people who are using that as their springboard each week to the thoughts of inspiration that they need to lead their lives, that it's important for there to be something positive. The hymns uh, need to affirm the great old faith. And the, uh, the prayers need always to remind us that God is there and God is listening, God is hearing, God is answering in various ways. And uh, uh, you referred to the fact that I had recently been at Marble Collegiate Church. Uh, it's amazing to me that at that great old church on Fifth Avenue in New York, that every Sunday, uh, as I would stand at the Fifth Avenue door to greet people as they left the church, I would meet at least half a dozen people from around the world who had come there because they had read Peel's books on the power of positive thinking. Mm. They are still attracted to that. And I don't know why it is that uh, sometimes we think we have to be dolorous and sad and downcast in order to be effective spiritually. There isn't anything downcast about the Spirit of God. John, I would love to ask you a little something about your role as a writer. Um, I'm a pastor who writes, mm -hmm. and I know that you have written more than 50 books, which bowls me over. And there's so many people out there who would like to write and feel like maybe mm -hmm. God's calling them to. What's been your secret in being able to be that prolific while you've been doing all these other things as well? I'll tell you my secret, Lillian. Uh, I learned it a long time ago from uh, the English bishop, Stephen Neal. Uh, Stephen uh, was the bishop, I think, of South Africa or may have been South India, I don't remember, but he was a fine old gentleman who for all of his life as a minister wrote practically nothing. And then suddenly, when he retired, books started pouring out. And somebody said, Stephen, what's happened to you? You used to write almost nothing and now you're writing all these books continually. His response was, oh, I just decided that anything worth doing was worth doing poorly. <laughs> now, <laughs> I don't mean that entirely, but I think a lot of people get hung up feeling that they've got to write a perfect book. 
And a book is always a team product. It's not just the author. It's the author and the editors, usually more than one. It's the producers, the, the managers who see all the things that have to be done, uh, done so the book can come out. And, you know, if you just see it as a process and realize it's part that, that you can do something that isn't perfectly done, but that expresses your soul and your being, uh, then you can write. Now, that doesn't mean it will get published necessarily. These are difficult days for publishing. But uh, I, uh, one of my joys in recent years has been to help people with projects like that who are working on them and guide them as they... I, there was a woman in New York who came to see me a few weeks ago who was having a terrible time in life. She had four children. And she and her husband were no longer together and the children were teenage years now. And her life was just hectic. But she had been a registered nurse for years, and as we talked, I heard about all these wonderful experiences she had had with people. And I said to her, you need to write these things. And a couple of days later, I got an email from her, and she sent me the first piece that she had written, and I would advised her to send it to Guidepost magazine. And she was getting it all ready to go, and it was wonderful. She, she just needed to be told she could do it. She needed permission, and, maybe. You know, one of your hallmarks as a, as a writer is that you tell these wonderful stories, and they're stories that we can all relate to about people. I was curious, do you check with the people before you tell their stories? Only if it's a bad story. I ah. mean, uh, I would not tell a st and I wouldn't use the person's name if it were uh, a story that cast some kind of shadow on a person. But as long as uh, it's upbeat and so forth, I've never found that people mind it. And uh, I've, I've uh, even told stories uh, uh, in a congregation where the people were there, as long as it didn't betray a confidence of any kind, but it, it sort of shone the spotlight for a moment on that person who was doing a very Christian act or who was living in, a, in an exemplary way. Because, and, and I always felt it made these people proud. People like to be noticed for their good deeds. Aww. We've only got about 15 seconds left, John. When yeah. do we expect the next book? Uh, uh, it comes in uh, March. The Jerry Falwell book will Looking. be out in March. I lived with him for six years across town, and it's a reflection on life in his town. It Fantastic. sounds fascinating. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you.